Hello, everyone. Good evening. We are getting started. Um, we have some additional seats over here. If some people would like a seat for this evening and not the stand, I recommend coming up over here. We have three seats over here. We have one over here. We have at least one or two up here. Or you can stand. It's good too. Um, hello, my name is Andrew. I'm one of the producers here at the Long Now Foundation. Um, before we get started, we're just going to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, please remember to silence your cell phones. Um, there's some standing area over here. We ask this be more of the standing room so that we can keep the exits clear over by the orrery. Um, and tonight's program is going to be a little bit longer than we usually do. So um, we just encourage you to take care of yourself. If you need to go to the bathroom or grab a drink or something, feel free to. You're not being disruptive. Don't worry. Um, that's it. So we all learned in kindergarten that sharing is a virtue, one of those things that's essential for playing together well. Yet as we get older, we're told to orient our lives towards personal achievement, career development, and accumulating property, often at the expense of sharing. What would it take to deprogram this persuasive culture norm and take radical sharing seriously? What would it take for you to willingly give up something you love, something that's part of your identity or you worked hard for? Joining us to explore these questions this evening is Beta Adriance and Chelsea T. Hicks. Beta is a Dutch artist and novelist who came to us via our board member, Brian Eno, and is the visionary behind all the programming for tonight. Chelsea T. Hicks is an indigenous activist, artist, musician, and poet. Before we get to the rest of the evening, we're going to start with a performance art video exploring the idea of radically taking over public space. Note this video is meant to be sonically disruptive. Enjoy.
This was a video by uh, Amelie Sveska Auru. She's a Danish upcoming artist. And in this video, she explores what it means when you break the unspoken rules in our shared property, a public space. What I also really like about it is that it shows what happens when you uh, interrupt the status quo, when you raise your voice and become a nuisance. Sometimes your voice is drowned out by the noise. Sometimes you're sh shrill and annoying. Sometimes people stare at you. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you so much to the Long Now and the Interval for hosting us. And thank you all for being here and joining in this discussion. Tonight, we'll be talking about property and sharing. More specifically, we'll be talking about the question, what can individuals and communities do in order to change the trajectory of increasing inequality in the long term? Welcome. Don't worry. I'm happy you're here. Um, I'll be talking with Chelsea Hicks, uh, my guest and fellow author, who will join me in a little bit. And together we'll be looking for answers and ideas. And we also have very exciting virtual guests who are already taking action on this topic in many ways, as maybe a lot of you are doing as well. Um, and they are going to share their ideas and thoughts with us. There's also a role for you this evening. Um, we hope that you too will share your ideas, thoughts, experiences, knowledge with us. There's, you found these two things on your seat. Uh, on the back of this flyer, you can take some notes if you want. And this flyer has a question. We hope you'll be willing to answer this question because this talk tonight will lead uh, up to an event at the Internet Archive on Friday, which is a workshop where we will try to take this conversation into action or take the first steps towards action. And your ideas and thoughts and suggestions will be the first steps in that process. So before we get started, I would like to tell you a little bit about what got me thinking about inequality. A few years back, I started writing my second novel called What's Mine? And it's about a man named Luis, who lives in an apartment that he inherited from his mother. When someone shows up who says, Luis has inherited this apartment in an unjust way. From there, the story escalates, and it escalates in ways that I didn't imagine when I started writing the book. At the same time, my personal life was going through very big changes as well. When I started writing the book, I was in a white, privileged, middle-class kind of way, poor. I was in a huge debt. Um, by the time I was halfway through the book, I was no longer in debt, I was no longer poor, and my life had changed massively. Uh, everything got a lot better when I got out of crushing debt. Uh, for instance, I was able to I have time to make my art. I was able to quit my cleaning job. I was able to buy materials for my art. I sold a lot more. I got jobs that suited my skills better. I was able to go to important <laughs> meetings in London and Brussels and buy train tickets. I was even able to get a, a haircut for those meetings. So while my life improved massively, I got stuck with a novel because I was writing about this guy who had to ask himself, am I really entitled to what I have? And how much can I share? And I wasn't ready to ask myself that question. I was so happy to get out of trouble that I didn't want to think about that, about sharing. Um, and all the research I was doing for the book on inequality, on sharing, on property rights, suddenly made me very, feel really uneasy. Well, before, these injustices just seemed like something that someone else should really be doing something about. And I thought, 
do I feel guilty about inequality? Which seemed like such a pointless feeling to me. And then I realized it was responsibility that I felt. And not in the sense that I felt responsible, but in the sense that I now had room in my life to do something. I now had the ability to respond, a responsibility. Uh, so I did. Um, I found out there are a lot of people who felt like me, that they had an unease about where society was and that they had this urge to take action. And the question is, what can we do? I started uh, together with Anne Fick and Rod de Wies, who are both based here in the Bay Area, a network for scientists, artists, people in media and businesses to work together on social topics. The outcome so far has been uh, really incredible. We've uh, made a children's book. We've created a school program that we implemented in schools together with teachers and scientists. And we very often get together with people from all kinds of fields to talk about how can we effectively um, take action. So that's what we're doing here tonight, uh, to see if we can find ways together to take action. And I hope you will be willing to help. Uh, I was able to finish the book in the end, by the way, it's here. Um, before, we, before I ask Chelsea to join me, I just want to share a tiny bit of the research um, that convinced me that this topic is deserving of our attention. Studies like the World Inequality Report from 2022 have shown that inequality has been steadily on the rise since the 70s. Inequalities within countries are now even bigger than inequalities between countries. And in advanced countries like the US, inequality is increasing the strongest. Some percentages, 1% um, of the global population holds 38% of global wealth. And I'm aware that you've heard these percentages before, but I just want to repeat them. 0.1% of the global population holds 11% of global wealth, while the poorest half of the world holds 2% of global wealth. The collective wealth of the billionaires is increasing with 2 billion, a 2.7 billion every day. So individuals, individuals have gotten richer, governments have gotten poorer, and of course it's not just about wealth inequality, it's also income, resources, education, healthcare, access to opportunities, um, and our contribution to carbon emissions, um, all these inequalities are increasing and it affects everyone. Also the people on the um, more pleasant side of this equation are affected because it's shown many times that when inequality increases, social cohesion lessens and crime rises. So this is the science. I'm not a scientist. I have a really hard time remembering um, these statistics I've looked them up many times, I talked about them many times, and they just won't stick. Um, I remember feelings, so I remember what it feels like when, for instance, I stop at a traffic light here in San Francisco and I see a homeless mother and her three children asking for help, and I drive on. I, I know what it feels like when I see somebody lying on the pavement and I don't know if they're sleeping, or passed out or dead. Uh, and I know what it feels like, and I remember what it feels like when a student gets into a pre prestigious master program that could catapult their career, and then they don't have the money to pay the fees. So may maybe there's other things that you remember. Maybe you remember faces or anecdotes, things that happened to you or in your family. Maybe you are a real statistics kind of person who looks at the hard numbers. Um, I'm a story-oriented person. So I think about these things through stories. We can examine our feelings through stories and we can 
share our values through stories, and we can also hold on to our values through stories. And from our values, we make decisions, and from our decisions, we take action. The people I have invited are already taking action. They're doing things. I'm very grateful to everyone who is doing things because you'll be criticized. Uh, you'll be criticized for what you are doing and you'll be criticized what, for what you aren't doing. Uh, but we have to do things. We have to start taking action because that 0.1% who holds 11% of global wealth is very actively doing things right now. Um, my guest for tonight, my co-host is Chelsea T. Hicks. She's an Osage writer and artist. She has, um, she's one of the first authors to publish her book in her ancestral language of Washaji Ia. She has founded Words of the People and she's active in the Land Back Movement, uh, focusing on the concept of rematriation, which I'm sure she'll tell us something about. And I've gotten to know Chelsea through her story collection, A Calm and Normal Heart, in which she introduces words from the Wazazi Iya language. Welcome, Chelsea. Dolly, thank you, Betta. It's so good to be here, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, so we're going to be talking about a really big topic. Um, we're going to be talking about it by asking three questions, and the, these questions will be building onto each other. So um, the first question is, what is your own connection to the words property and sharing? So how do you relate to those concepts? What part do they play in your life? The next question is, how can we fix past injustices around property or improve future ways of sharing? So where could our attention be or where should our attention be? And then the final big question, what can individuals and communities do in order to change this trajectory of increasing inequality in the long term? Very big questions. We'll start with the first one, the, the smaller one. Mm -hmm. um, Chelsea, <laughs> what is your connection to the words property and sharing? Yeah, so when I think about property and sharing, I think about uh, home ownership first. And I live in my ancestral lands, the outer edge of Wajaje or Osage hunting grounds, which is in Dotsile, Deer Tracks, Tulsi, Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, I want to own a home but I, but I don't, and our reservation is nearby about an hour north of Tulsa, and I think that uh, owning a home there is a way to signal to our community today that we're invested in our people, our language, and carrying on our ways. However, in 1906, uh, that land which we had purchased collectively from the Cherokees when we were being forced out of Kansas, uh, in 1906, that land was allotted, and that meant it was divided up into individual plots of land, which we didn't know how to live that way, and it was it was very um, impactful in a negative sense for our community. And we were also given oil head rights at that time, which uh, that oil ownership, because we owned the we had negotiated to own the minerals six inches under the six feet under the ground that had. Um, resulted in us becoming wealthy from oil and then subsequently attracting uh, murders and violence against our people. So today, oil is enmeshed in our identity. And so I think I have, and all Native people today may have like a complex relationship with ownership because we can't live uh, communally as we used to. You know, it was outlawed and, and we were warred upon for, for that concept. So it, it holds a lot of tension. I read that the, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the Allotment Act was forced on your people. So they had to, before it was communally owned the land they shared, and then they were forced to individually start owning it. 
Yes, that's right. It was forced. And, you know, today we still have aspects of communal culture, like our Elonchka dances, which go the whole month of June, we have these community dinners and anyone can come and be fed. But people who are traditional cooks could often throughout the year be pay, be paid in blankets and they may not have the money or the gas money to get to the communal cooking uh, in order to feed all the people. So you can see how there's a lot of tension around uh, the communal, even the society we live in is so set up to make it really difficult to even practice our communal ways, which are still going, but under complex tensions. And you've written this book and I really recommend it. It's called A Calm and Normal Heart. And in this book, Chelsea introduces words from the Roshaji Ia language um, and through these words that you learn as you read the book, you get to know concepts of your culture. Mm -hmm. Did you learn about some cultural concepts by, um, you started learning the language, right? You yeah. didn't grow up with it. No. Did you learn uh, some cultural values as well as you? Yes. So you may hear like the term rematriation tonight, and we'll talk about it a little bit and what it means. but. The, it's another way of saying it. One way of saying it is reconnection, which is popular for Native people today because in 1956, the Native American Relocation Act took a lot of people away from their reservations into cities. But even before that, for Osages, when we had uh, this oil money and there, the reign of terror, like Osage murders for oil money was going on, quite a many number of Osages moved to California because they were fleeing those murders and they had the resources to do it. So uh, for me, I grew up in Virginia and uh, my paternal grandmother, my eco, had gone to boarding school and the result of any native person today has a grandparent who went to boarding school. Like, and the, the, one of the results of that is language loss. And so no Osage people today um, speak Osage language. We're revitalizing it. It's a dormant language. And I was impacted to learn it in 2016 when I 2017 when I received this challenge from poets in Chiapas and Oaxaca in Mexico and they gave a challenge to United States native writers. Why aren't you writing in your languages? So I, I thought that was absurd because it's an oral language and no one speaks it. But I just started looking into it and our tribe was making efforts to revitalize it and had released an app. So I was I had been going through these intense mental health crises in my 20s. And when I started to learn the language and reconnect to my tribe, I stabilized like totally. And um, so those those concepts that are in the language, one of them I can note is, um, you know, in English we have like this object oriented sense. A lot of things are objects or function as objects and subjects, but in uh, it's not it's not like that. There's a lot more animacy like uh, in relationships to everything, especially uh, plants and land. So that's another tie into ownership is mm -hmm. there's this idea of ancestral land and like that our land is kind of uh, living and it's part of our bodies. So that's a concept from the language. That Is that also why there was a communal ownership of the land uh, instead of this individual chopping it up into pieces? I can imagine if you see the earth as a living thing, you might not be so inclined to ch chop it up into pieces. <laughs> <laughs> or am I just fantasizing? No, me? as I, I mean, I'm not an expert in, you know, like world people groups over time. Um, but as I understand it, you know, more anciently, you know, everyone here, you know, your your bodies are sort of coming from an ancestral land base when you look at your four grandparents and where they may have, their ancestors may have lived, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And and so when you're living uh, in, in, in where there's uh, indigenous plants to that continent, continent, and then you yourself are indigenous to that continent, there's a kinship and a relationship. And, um, you know, you just travel for your needs and you t take care of each other because you all share an initiative and an objective. And that is to carry on your ways and protect your plants and um, sort of take care of one another. And so I think the reason that land is more divided like that, one reason that it might be is because as people in the United States, we don't necessarily share these 
objectives or these ways, we're fragmented, isolated, and disassociated from one another. So there's no basis for an inherent ability to take care of and care for one another because we don't necessarily share a common interest. That's a really good answer. And I think it will link with uh, our guests tonight who are here on the screen. Um, first is Akitami. I will uh, say a little bit. Something happened with the sound. Is this okay? Are we good? All right. Well Thank done. You. <laughs> Um, Akitami is, uh, she's a Tangmi woman from the Kiratima First Peoples of the Himalaya. She's also an artist. She grew up in the tea plantations of Darjeeling. And she moved, uh, she traveled to mainland India when she was 15 without any resources or connections. And she started working as an artist. Since then, she has founded the Sister Library which is the first feminist library of India. This is a communal place where people can get together and read texts by women, also women from traditionally oppressed castes and tribes, uh, as her tribe uh, traditionally has also been oppressed. She's also started Darafi Ardrum. Uh, Darafi is known, maybe you know it from the movie Slumdog Millionaire. It's known as the biggest uh, slum area in Mumbai. And in the middle, um, Aki has started an art room where locals get together and make art. She has also started a fellowship for girls to get a higher education. She sets up resources, uh, for instance, during the COVID lockdown. She started a food program or when there's floods. Alongside this, she somehow also has a flourishing art practice. Yes, and she's very young. Margaret Levy, uh, she's a, a political scientist, a professor. Um, you may have seen her before here at the Interval. And I got to know her through her thinking and writing on the concept of a community of faith. F-A-T-E, not faith, faith. <laughs> um, which is based on the concept that we all have a community of people that we believe our faith is linked with. That's our community of faith. Um, and Margaret, one of her concerns that she addresses is that people see their community of faith as a very small group mm -hmm. and they define the others as threatening and denying all our complex mutual in the, in the interdependencies in the process. Brian Eno, he is uh, well known as a musician and an artist as well as a writer and speaker. Um, he is the co-founder of The Long Now. Uh, he has, he's a long-term thinker, and um, therefore, I think it makes sense that he's in the ecological movement. He founded a charity called Earth Percent. I encourage you to look it up. It's, in my own words, it's a way to pay your tax to the earth. So it allows for artists to share a percentage of their income with the earth, and this money goes to groups that protect the planet or help restore the planet. I've had a lot of conversations with Brian about um, the role art can play in examining society's feelings and redefining new values. And a lot of what I say originated in uh, those conversations. And I've asked them the question that I've asked Chelsea. I'm very involved right now in a project that's actually thinking about reimagining property rights. It involves an academic perspective, which comes from me and my team, and two organizations, uh, Dark Matter and Radical Exchange, which are actually engaged in, in on-the-ground work of designing new ways of property rights and property writing, as Dark Matter calls it. Our goals here are to transform the kind of mindset that we have that was built, at least in the West, in the 18th century, 
and undermining in many ways, emphasizing private property and therefore undermining all kinds of common property and shared property. So our goal is to think about what property can do for people and property rights can do for people in terms of economic well-being, in terms of politics and political equality, and in terms of protecting the environment, the earth, and indigenous cultures, and then designing institutions that will achieve those ends and that are alternatives to the current framework that we have. I think to approach the word property, I think of it uh, from a very decolonial standpoint because of my identity as an indigenous person and how my community, the Thangmis, did not really have a concept of property as it is experienced and uh, is conceptualized in the world today. Property in the sense of owning land and owning a house and we did not have that. So we had like communally owned spaces that were not permanent. It was always shifting. And I'm talking about like thousands of years back when we lived as free people that are not colonized. There never was this concept of really owning property, really owning land. Everything was there for everyone to communally share and be a part of. And that is how I think of property as well now, like thankfully because of this practice that my ancestors had. I think it's from memory in my genes or something. I always long for spaces that are more collective, spaces where we did not have like a single authoritative figure would be the owner and a rule maker. And then everyone would have to adhere to that. and or generate wealth for the owner of the property. And maybe that is why I never really <laughs> had a job. I became an artist and uh, started creating spaces that could be owned by everyone, where uh, people could think of ownership and property differently. And an example of that could be Sister Library, where people who come to the library, I tell them that the library is as much theirs as it's mine because the books have been mine, but it's an open space, which is community run. Everyone is welcome to participate and think together to lead the space in different directions. I think what's really needed now is a discussion about what should be in common ownership, what should be regarded as unownable, by any individual, and what can be allowed to be private. I think artworks being relatively unimportant parts of the world, in some respects, can be privatized, can, can be private. I think water supplies, land, air, certain medical types of um, intervention shouldn't be private. I think they should be publicly owned. They should be a commons, in fact. So, of course, it's easy for somebody like me to say they should be a commons, but the question will immediately come, so who maintains the commons and who pays for the commons? This is a complicated question, and I don't know if this is the place to try to answer that. It's, it's a question that I've been thinking about a lot because certain aspects of my life that are currently private, I've tried to make into a commons. This studio, for example, um, more and more I use it as a place where people meet to have conversations. So it's become a sort of, it's become common property of a lot of people. Though, of course, my name is still on the deeds and I still pay the <laughs> rates. But I've tried to deal with this issue of uh, what should be privately ownable and by saying that Actually, I'm not sure that property of this kind should be privately owned. So I'm trying to work out a kind of compromise, which I think is a type of compromise that a lot of people will have to be thinking about in the future, as the notion of unlimited private property becomes more and more difficult to sustain. So, you know, there are lots of people who own things, and 
perhaps like me, they, they question whether they ought to own them outright. And maybe there is room for some sort of future where we make kind of co-ownership agreements with the rest of the world. Giving is, is actually a bigger pleasure than getting. And I think one of the social transformations we might see soon is the understanding of that, that to reverse that, the sort of capitalist model where pleasure comes from getting and say, no, actually, pleasure comes from giving. Pleasure comes from sharing. One thing that these uh, speakers agree on is that um, sharing seems increasingly urgent and sharing of uh, re rethinking property rights seems unnecessary. It brings up this question of responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the question of how we got to the place where we are now that we own things. So I'm Dutch. My country has been very active in the past in stealing, slave trading. Do I have more because of what my country did? And how is that for a starting point to start saying, and now I would like to share. Um, and it brings up a question. It's not one of the three questions, a question that I wanted to ask you, Chelsea. Um, when I got to know you and reading your work, I started looking up um, whose land it was originally that we're on, and I looked up the land that we are now originally on, and I'm from the Netherlands, you probably already know this, uh, Ramatush Olone peoples have not owned mm -hmm. this land. Mm -hmm. um, I see a lot of people making a declaration at the beginning of a fence saying, I want to acknowledge, and I felt strange about it because I thought mm. if I would steal Fred shoes, and then I would say, I just want to acknowledge that these shoes are <laughs> Fred's. It's, if you don't connect that to any kind of action, would, how do you feel about these acknowledgements and would you like to acknowledge something about where we are now? <laughs> Sorry, is this a hard question? No, I, I, I think I'm just laughing with everyone else. It's great. And I appreciate the question. Yeah, so the... The Ohlone, the Mwekma Ohlone people are here today. Uh, they have an Ohlone cafe where they share uh, some of their traditions and they have uh, a language and a culture and they're very um, alive and present. And they, um, the Sigorite Land Trust, uh, yeah, <laughs> has has become a land collective that is indigenously run, and that's here in San Francisco. And they're working to kind of, the way I would, this is my personal opinion, I'm not speaking for anyone but myself, but I, I feel that Native American people are not necessarily functioning indigenously across all nations in the United States. And that for myself, you know, to function indigenously, I think you are operating as a land protector and you're also working with some of your plants. And so they are doing that. They're restoring that uh, and it's native women led. And so if you want to, you know, think about like taking the action towards these shoes, these Ohlone mocks, moxins, um, you know, you could look for ways to support um, the Segorite land trust. Thank you. Uh, this ties in with the second question that we have. How can we fa fix past injustices around property or f uh, improve future ways of sharing? And you shared a video with us has to do with injustices and in sharing. I'll just play it first. It's by artist Nathan Young. Do you want to say something before we play it? Oh, well, just a moment ago when you were talking about um, how land ownership works in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. um, and how did we come to this place of land being divided? I, I just thought it was an interesting reflection to share that, um, as I understand it in the United States, when the, in order for someone to become a statesman during the colonial period, you had to be a landowner. 
and you had to be married. And these were symbols of uh, your ability to steward land. So it was a kind of a moral worldview estimation of a person as a good person or not. That could you be uh, like have uh, purity kind of. So it's Christian values that the foundation of the United States is created on. And those come from this idea of land ownership. And, and as I understand it as well, you know, that was used and politicized by the Roman Empire to help spread empire. And so I think that's why, um, anyway. <laughs> so this video will be by Nathan Young, who uh, is Lenape, and that's the land from the, from New York area in Manhattan. And he's uh, a great Tulsa artist fellow and a friend, and he has this video with Plains Indian Sign Language, which was a shared way of talking, sort of a common tongue for um, peoples across, Native people who had come into contact with each other. So, yeah. We are I have to say, I haven't... Sorry, this is my bad. It's in the wrong order. I'm going to just go to video. Here we go. So, yeah, in this video, uh, which is, we were able to get it from Oklahoma Contemporary Show, uh, and so just acknowledging them, I think, like, we see this problem with sharing. And if you want to say, okay, let's share, right, let's really go into how can you do that? How can you make it work? And 
sharing knowledge, sharing resources with people with whom there's a power imbalance or a values difference uh, clearly has, has consequences. And we know that from the history of our nation. And so I, I think that with Native people today, you know, Native people have our own stories and histories that we don't necessarily share and not necessarily willing to share knowledge or share anything with people who we would deem as, as outsiders or settlers or non-natives. And so in order to in, investigate how can you share, I think you have to look at, at the value system underlying the sharing and like what kind of worldview and ethics and uh, faith community the, the sharing is coming from. And so, um, yeah, maybe I'll stop there. It's, so you're, what you're touching on is this idea that you can share, but before you share, if you establish, you have to establish trust. So uh, a mutual trust, I guess, yeah, what ways can trust be established? You said if you recognize that you have shared values. Right, because in, in uh, Turtle Island, like on this continent, when we're encountering, you know, uh, church whites, right? We're just seeing them as, oh, it's a people who we don't know and they're hungry. And uh, as Brian Eno was saying, you know, sharing is the real gift. Like in, in Osage culture, you know, generosity is one of our important, most important, highest values. That when you show generosity towards someone, you're taking care of them. And that it creates a relationship that, you know, they would take care of you too. And there's the, a kinship of just being a person. And so that, that comes from the idea that no people are, are really bad. You know, people aren't bad or sinful. But in, in Christianity, the concept of forgiveness is very strong. And so you could be forgiven for a sin if it was for God's will, right? But in, in Wajajia, we don't have a word for I'm sorry. And so if you there's there's more of an emphasis on having good ways and doing things that um, just are respectful. And so I think we have to like acknowledge some of the um, complications within like our different worldviews. And I think that it's fine, you know, to have any religion that you want, but it's really important to respect the radical dignity of every person, even if they don't believe the same as you. I think another way that um, we establish trust, it's not really trust, but by contracts, by saying you'll be punished if you don't do it right. uh, the way we agreed upon. So I guess that's why we do it in business. Yeah. Um, by yeah. writing it down. Right. Uh, contracts and con law, as you, as you address so well in your book. And yeah, I mean, I guess that's one more thing I would note is that when it comes to establishing the trust, like why Native people would just automatically help these people, these Fiji, poor, pitiful, wakpa, these humble people that we don't know is that um, like when the black robes or the Jesuits came and they told us their story of, of Jesus, we, we had it in our oral tradition that they gave us a stack of leaves with a new moral code on it. So we were thankful for that because we had now a new uh, code, which adds an enrichment or, a, or a, a new, just more, more abundance of understanding. And we also then told them our, our stories because it was understood that when someone tells you their stories, you believe them and you respect it and it's holy and it's sacred. And there wasn't that reciprocity within Christianity and the way Christianity became tied to land owning. It was one, one story is the only one and, and one way is the only one. And so I think if we can look at like the foundational laws of our country and of some of these contracts and where the ideas come from, that can help us like recreate a sense of actually all people are all nations are equal and all people are equally dignified. And it's not like some people are basically savages and that, that those concepts and those language are still in our laws and they're still alive and they still operate within our minds, even if we don't fully, um, are fully aware of it. Uh, let's watch what the, the people on the screen have said in reply to this question on past injustices 
and future ways of sharing? The answer is in the question, like individuals and communities. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Oh, right. We had there to go back. Some people were on it. They were already <laughs> looking at me like. They were worrying about you. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. I have to say, I haven't thought very much about the first part of that question, past injustices. And that's partly because I suppose I see the present injustices so clearly as a continuation of those anyway. So I've been thinking about how do we change things in the present tense? And of course, one of the most important of those is huge wealth inequality, which has increased dramatically in the last 20 or 30 years. Generally, there's a chasm opening between the very rich and everybody else. So it seems to me completely sensible to have progressive taxation aimed specifically at taming that, that inequality. And I also think having uh, caps on wealth is a very worthwhile idea. That's, that's one, that's the sort of financial version of inequality. The other thing I think is important is to try to see who we actually value in society and to perhaps, perhaps ask ourselves the question of why is it that the people we value most usually get paid least? So I think we have to fix past injustices. We see particularly with land and buildings, but also other corporations as well, I shouldn't say particularly land and buildings, that there has been an inequitable, from my perspective, certainly an unequal by all perspectives, distribution of the income and even the capacity to control what those buildings provide and do or what those corporations do. So we have, if we turn to firms, let's start there, there have been arguments for a very long time about polluting firms, about what to do when a firm that is, say, coal producing, even apart from the fossil fuel question, but when it's actually polluting the air around it and who, who pays to fix that up or who pays for the health costs of those who are both working in that plant as well as those who are affected by those that plant. Those are past injustices which over time the laws have evolved in part, large part, because of public pressure, often union pressure, sometimes just interest group lobbies and um, mobilized citizens to fix those clear injustices that emerge from the property rights. When we look at big buildings today, particularly those which have traditionally been offices and which a lot of workers are returning to, there's lots of empty commercial office space. Any big city almost anywhere in the world right now is suffering, and some more than others, is suffering from a serious homelessness problem or a lack of sufficient residents. Why can't we transform some of those uh, spaces into residences? Well, we can't because of the nature of the property rights and who has priority there in determining how those things should be used and what kind of income should be flowing from it. That's an injustice we need to change if we are actually going to make some distance on providing housing for all those who need it, given that we and not building so much more housing and, and creating all kinds of environmental problems with the drain on water and, and resources and land that we already have in our urban spaces. And then the final big injustice, of course, is the injustice that comes from the way in which the property rights system has worked. Certain actors get a disproportionate share of the revenue. It's not surprising right now that we're seeing unionization begin to arise again, at least in the United States, where it had clearly declined. 
So those are some of the kinds of injustices that flow from property rights and that can, can be corrected by action and by changes in laws. It's important to understand how different societies also experience property and how it is linked with power and uh, relationship and social hierarchy. Although it may not be true for all the societies, but like so for some societies like the caste society in India and in, in other South Asian countries, there is relationship between property ownership and caste status as well which i think has to be dismantled in you know as a child i never thought i was a servant even if i grew up in a house where everyone was in the plantation slavery i never thought i was destined to be a slave because i did not understand that and my parents never told me that that is what i was destined to be it was only when i left the house I was told continuously that there's no point. Even in my school, I was told there's no point studying because some people are just meant to serve others. There is that very racist notion or like of people who have been historically disenfranchised to be just, again, like just people who are supposed to be poor and people who do not have that space at all. And for that, like when we talk about property and when we talk about sharing, I think these forms of injustices are the ones that are still practiced and practiced by people who are just like everyday people, you know, people who teach in universities to people who are like working as rickshaw drivers. It's like across class who still hold these views. And it's because these are like these are notions that are pre-modern forms of governance it's like pre-democratic system it is pre-capitalism even it goes beyond it goes beyond thousands of years and so we'll have to start with radical change there and for people to understand that everybody is capable of of experiencing ownership and property and I think after we come to a space where there is that understanding we can start thinking of how property can be experienced differently and not just through this very model of inheritance and uh, like this very patriarchal lineage system. Interesting to me that well uh, Brian and Margaret are really practical mm -hmm. we need to get on with this and do these things and they're mm -hmm. very sensible areas where our attention should be. And then there, you and Aki emphasize, mm -hmm. before we do this, we need to establish trust, see each other, acknowledge each other, value each other, and um, restore some yeah. um, problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the, the first two had a, an emphasis on systemic and policy changes, which can do so much, but in order to affect such a humongous change as to create bit more sharing and, and radical equity, I think it can't be accomplished in one generation. I think it would take seven generations. That's usually the amount of time that like native people plan like a, like a, I guess, like a, a cycle for. And so I think that it begins with the individual and everybody that I really believe in making reparations and reparative work. And you can simply look at your ancestry and people get so like freaked out, like it's such a big deal, like let, oh, my grandfather, my great grandmother did this, but everybody has like a lot of different ancestors. And some of your ancestors, even from your four grandparents, you had the grandparents that you liked and were great. And some of them, you know, needed some support <laughs> to act better in their life. And if you, um, I really think that you can simply look at your family and some of the things that your family, your grandparents, your great grandparents, your great, great grandparents, your great, great, great grandparents, and so on and so forth. You can simply just look at 
some of the things that they did in their life that you're proud of and you think had a good effect and were good for you and good for other people, as well as things they did, which although they benefited you, were usurious and need reparative work. And you can simply make reparations by noting the communities that they may have disenfranchised and working to support those communities. Um, through any reparative work doesn't just mean paying reparations. I do think that's important. But the land back movement as well, I think you can actually give land back to Native nations. You can actually do reparative work. And it's not that crazy. Um, I also think that you shouldn't only be focusing on yourself as this like power holder and writer of past wrongs. You also need to look at your disinheritance of what colonization and Christian spread of empire may have removed from you anciently. And, you know, sometimes people get this idea of like, oh, I, don't, I did go back to Ireland and I bought a kill, but really there was nothing in that. It's not about necessarily going into like the the colonial structures that exist today. I think it's um, something simple that you can do is look up a continent that you know your body is kind of coming from according to the framework I'm presenting. Maybe you think differently about science. That's fine. But a continent that you know you have a deep protective spiritual tie to hundreds and thousands of years ago and look up a plant that grows indigenously on that continent just a plant that grows across the whole continent instead of burning sage um, in your apartment burn that plant and pray with it and think about your reparative work with it and do your 10 minute calm meditation with that plant instead of the you know the commercialized smudging white shamanism thing and then also, the other thing you can do is look at the issues that are affecting that land now in terms of resource extraction on that continent and just research it and learn more about it. And, you know, I'm not saying you need to go re-indigenize yourself to a continent and leave the United States. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you can have more resources by getting rid of some of that guilt by doing reparative work looking at the issues, taking action, praying with the plants, because that's a resource that you deserve to have inherited, that you have been cut off from. And it's a horrible thing. And you need to be re-strengthened. That you said that really well. I, you said before I, that the question of what can individuals and communities do, you had spent some time thinking about it and it was hard to answer. And here you go, like, <laughs> this is what you can do. Um, let's look at what um, Brian, Margaret, and Aki said about it. And now I'm just hoping that it's there. There it is. the answers in the question like individuals and communities can do like you know you have to start doing and doing without expectation I think it is something that I have also learned through practice I was always taught to expect a certain return after you do the work but that's not how things work you just do, you just give, you just share without expecting there's going to be this return. So like when we are doing the scholarship for the girls, like the Walking with Savitri My Fellowship or like supporting the women in Dharavi during the COVID crisis or uh, just putting together resources when there are floods and or even doing the library. I think this idea that this is going to be the input and this is going to be the output of it. It's also sort of very capitalist uh, exchange. And we, I try to step out of that and just do. And it's also, this is the reason why we are not funded by a huge corporation or any grant, because this is what the grants ask as well. Like, you know, you put this and then there has to be a result and then there has to be a multiplication of that result and you have to scale up. And that's not how I function at all. You just do. And then it may turn into something that is positive and it may turn into something that is great, but it may not also. 
but that should not stop us from doing. And I think everybody is capable of doing, like everybody is capable of giving back. Here, I'm going to come right back to politics. I really think political solutions are needed. And that involves ensuring political equality, one. So getting, making sure that everybody who wants to vote can vote, that they're as informed as they can possibly be, that they have the political capacity to exercise voice in appropriate ways. But it's incredibly important to build democracies that one not only listen to those various voices and take them on and help to resolve conflicts in the ways that we've been talking about, but also by creating that kind of democracy and reduce and creating political equality within democracy, we reduce the power of the super powerful and increase the power of the less powerful and of the ma- of the majority really of the multiple voices that need to be heard and that i think is crucial for achieving economic equality because what's standing in our way here what's standing in our way is a series of government rules that in we're back to property rights here that enable certain people to disproportionately benefit from the kinds of property rights structure that we have. And if we're going to change the rules of the game, if we're going to change the legislation, that requires immense political pressure. And it has to be a relatively even playing field. And it is not right now. So what do I think people should do? They need to vote, but they need to mobilize others to vote. They need to fight. They need to fight for the issues they care about in a way that is civil and takes into account the interests of others. And they have to be able to exert political pressure in a collective way on their legislators so that some change can actually be brought about. The first uh, realization we have to have is that there are no externalities. If you are producing things and using resources and and dumping uh, the wastes from those, you have to take responsibility for for every effect of of what you're doing in as far as those things can be measured and discerned. That actually straight away is a huge inequality reducer. The second thing I'd say is, as Margaret Levy said, unionization. That is so important, I think. It really makes a difference if workers have a voice and their voice is recognized and respected. Third thing I'd talk about is reform of politics itself. We're stuck with political models that really date from the 19th century, and yet there are new ones emerging, which are much, much more interesting and exciting and liberating. And those are things like citizens' assemblies, particularly the kinds of citizens' assemblies that have participants chosen by lottery. Um, or sortition as it's known. The last thing I would say we could do, and this might seem like a quite weirdly uh, authoritarian stance to take, is that I think social media have to be reformed quite radically. At the moment, we're living with social media whose algorithms are specifically designed to create polarization, discontent, argument, and distraction. And we, more than ever, we need citizens to be engaged at the level of policy decisions. This is why that first suggestion of um, citizens' assemblies is important. But we need them to be informed. There's no point having citizens engaged in things if they're completely befuddled by the kind of rubbish that Fox News is putting out. So we really need to start thinking knowledge, understanding of the situation that we're in at at present is at an absolute premium. So those were a lot of um, potential areas where we could take action. Was there one thing that was mentioned that is significant to you, stands out where you think 
Um, I'm thinking about what Brian said about social media. I really agree with that. But um, in terms of taking action, like we haven't pointed it out yet, but it's probably obvious to everyone that, you know, the way Christianity influenced capitalism and United States law and the way those things influenced ownership and the way that influences sharing all influences also uh, the environment and land and global warming and the way that uh, the, the weather is changing and the land is changing. And to, to give an example of how he said, like, if you take responsibility or you even, even if you can't take responsibility personally for um, resource abuse, if you can stand up or ally with or protect land, that is very impactful because you create a community there of a shared initiative, which allows that sharing kind of uh, parameters to exist. And then on top of that, um, you are working with, I guess, decolonizing, decolonizing um, how we interact with our environment just through protecting land. To give an example, in Tulsa right now, they're looking at building uh, like a third dam near the south part of Tulsa. And part of the reason that uh, people can't kind of take action against the dam is because there's a narrative that and a uh, like a teaching and an understanding of of a river and this idea of what a river should look like. It should have sort of like a European aesthetic because it's still in some ways a colony here in the U.S. And so the, the Arkansas River is actually a braided prairie stream. It's not supposed to look like a high water river. It's supposed to look like sandbanks with streams of water weaving through. And so when people look at the river and they say, oh, how ugly. Wouldn't it be nice if it looked beautiful like a river? So why not build another dam? Because it fits into like my aesthetic that I'm bringing as like a colonial inheritance. And so if you can just, that's an example, like just by protecting, if you can stand up for the dam, you build the sense of community, you can protect the land and just the the pushback against that kind of 1% thing that you achieve through that results in people feeling more like uh, there's a sense of community. I should show up to vote because people are working to protect each other. So I don't know if I outlined that really well, but I think that when you go into one area of this, you go into all the areas of it and it has this ripple effect between land, people, wealth, property. And, and it also ties in with what both Margaret and Brian pointed out, uh, the importance of being informed and getting your information. Yeah. If you think that river, right. do you want the river to look nicer? Yeah. You know, but if you're informed, you can make a better judgment. And so these are all huge things that have been suggested. Um, we've been asking what kind of things can we do? What kind of projects can we embark on? Um, some things are... Uh, individual. So can we make a personal commitment? Start, can we start looking at our ancestors, where we came from, what that means? Can we make a commitment to take responsibility or try to make a commitment, if we have room in our lives, to be responsible for all the externalities that are, uh, that are caused by our existence? Uh, could it be communal? Should it be local or global? Should it be an art project, a storytelling project? Should it be political, like Margaret is saying? Who should the target audience be of a project like this? Uh, could it be children or politicians? There's a lot of uh, questions. And I think what is sure is that we need to do things. Um, and we need to get out of paralysis if we're in paralysis. And what will motivate us to do things? Hmm. Uh, I think it's our feelings. Hmm. Um, I think the things we talked about today, um, how we feel about each other, who we trust, uh, the feelings that we have about sharing that might be changing, uh, the feelings about who do we value in society. Um, a big motivator for people is how can I be happier? Mm -hmm. You said you became happier when you connected mm -hmm. uh, to your 
ancestral lands mm -hmm. and your values. So this is where you come in. That's a really hard part. Uh, we would really like your personal take on this. You all have this piece of paper. Let's see. With the question, what can individuals and communities do in order to change the trajectory of increasing inequality in the long term? Please write your thoughts on it, maybe the products that you're involved in, your experiences, questions, things that were said tonight that you really agreed with or disagreed with, and there will be a place to leave them uh, before you go. Andrew knows. There it is. It's on the corner of the bar. Um, we will take your thoughts as a first step for the workshop at the Internet Archive on Friday. You're all invited to come. Uh, everybody who has an idea they want to share a question or a thought on Friday, they can give a lightning speech. It's Brian Eno's invention, a two-minute speech where you share what it is that you want to share. Um, and then we will continue that conversation Friday at 4.30 uh, together at the Internet Archive. Um, now we will have some time for you to write down whatever you want to write down and to ask uh, questions. Maybe you want to ask Chelsea questions um, about the things she's been talking about or about her beautiful book, which is also here for sale. such an ingrained cultural, historic, architectural, and community set of biases that we have inherited that have led us to the position where we have given over so much control of our planet to so few people. What fundamental change needs to happen in our thinking that has allowed us to give it all away so that we can find a way take it back you talked about values talked mm -hmm. about feelings what, what is that thing that has allowed us as a civilization as a people as a society to give 99.9 percent .9 to 0.1 percent and I think be happy it's the concept yeah thank you for the for the insightful question i think it's the concept that land is an object and that our bodies are not land our bodies are land we walk on the land we are animals with the other animals. We're part of, we are the land and the land is a person. The land is animate. Thank you for your well-formulated and really good question and important question, I think. Um, my take on this is it's tied to what I found out uh, as I got out of debt. Uh, if you're in debt, there's nothing you can do. Like you're in just, constantly stressed. Um, you can't expect much from people who are in that situation. Once you get more room to think and to feel, and you're able to do things, you realize how much of your um, humanity is actually stolen by the systems that we're living in. So if I walk past that person who is passed out, I don't want to, uh, but I cannot get involved. I've done it in my life and it doesn't turn out well because I don't have the skills to fix problems that huge. Um, but that is taking something from me. Uh, it's a, it, allows, it, it doesn't allow me to be the person who I want to be. Um, and I think when we start recognizing that the fact that we have no choice to buy, but buying tomatoes that were um, harvested by people who are underpaid that we have no choice to join a bank, uh, but to join a bank who is involved in land grabbing in Africa. That is changing who we are. It's changing our personality. We have to mute parts of ourselves, um, I believe. And that's my experience, that we don't want to mute. And I think, as Chelsea described, that she became happier when she returned uh, to her more communal living and found these values that she was in line with. I think when you're able to live more in line with your values, you become a lot happier. And I think I've seen so much commer commercials on TV in the US since I got here, 
and about half of them are, do you want to get happier? <laughs> uh, so <laughs> maybe that's a, a way in, you know, do you want to get happier? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, everyone can, if you want to expand the concept beyond like that, that's what I think the change that needs to happen is. But as to how you get toward that and how you integrate that understanding into every aspect of life, the like curriculum set for it is rematriation. And everyone can participate in rematriation. It's indigenous and black women led, I believe. Some people think it's just indigenous women led, but I think that black and indigenous people need to work together to help lead reparative work in the United States. But I think that, um, yeah, like you're just, first of all, it's kind of a simple process, but it, it goes beyond self-care because self-care, you can still get in trouble and get attacked for appropriation. And someone's going to tell you, go get your own culture. And so that's where um, rematriation came in, was it's a form of self-care that is anti-appropriative and anti-racist foundationally and by nature. So rematriation means reparative work for your ancestors, as well as learning what you've been disinherited of, reconnecting to um, the things that you've lost. You can do that through land. And I focus on land, like to give you like a, a broader brief overview of people who speak about these ideas and examples. You have um, N. Scott Mamaday, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer, and Natalie Diaz. And they each have a different kind of recommendation for you of how you do this. Robin Wall Kimmerer, will, her rhetoric is, as I understand it, it's kind of, you can indigenize yourself to the land where you live now by learning the beliefs of tribes by whom you live and uh, kind of allying with them if you can ever get them to even speak to you. I added that last part. <laughs> I noticed. <laughs> And then N. Scott Mamaday is saying kind of like, okay, I want to acknowledge that cowboys and ranchers have also lived on the land and they know the land and everyone has achieved some type of belonging in the United States through their tenure here. And so go beyond your tenure and begin to uh, keep the earth. And he, he talks about that through a story of like the grasshopper and that's in the book Earth Keeper. So it's kind of, I think I would translate it as to like, Basically, if you spend time with land, this is an idea that Dr. Phil Cash Cash, uh, who's Nimi Poo, uh, will say, in, the land will will speak to you. It will you'll get you'll get ideas through meditatively sitting with land. And put it that way in like the sort of English thought world thought worldview. And then Natalie Diaz will have none of either of those things. And she says, no, you need to go back to your ancestral waters and immerse your body in them because there's certain things you can't understand when you are disconnected from land. You come from land, you come from people. And we, when we come, we become so disconnected from that, we can't understand um, how to really be healthy and you know, I think Christianity and other, it becomes like a coping mechanism that's, you know, maybe better than like alcoholism, but I don't know that it's able to reverse the path. It doesn't have necessarily in and of itself solely the tools to reverse where we are in terms of our, our species taking care of each other and being able to continue surviving. I'm so glad that you added this part about if you can get them to talk to you, just for all the people who were banned or, <laughs> you know, exiled or... Right, restraining can't, order. Can't go back, you know, uh, not even allowed to go back into their countries. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, so you had a really good question. People who have really good questions sometimes also have very good answers. So do you also have your own answer? Mm. Oh, boy. Um, don't quote me about this. But I think we have to undo the value that we give to the accumulation of things mm -hmm. and reinstate the value of the accumulation of people. That's beautifully put. Yeah. That's really tough. Yeah. That will be hard because we have all grown up generation after generation believing that things are more important than people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
we're at time for the evening, um, but this conversation will continue tonight. Feel free to hang out and um, stick around for a second. And we'll also continue at the Internet Archive um, at 4.30, right? Um, yes, 4.30, Internet Archive. If you, you can sign up. There's a list where you can sign up. You can also send an email, and then we'll let you know how you can get in. And it will be informal and hopefully fun. Yeah, if, if you've never been, which I, I bet a lot of you actually have, but if you've never been, it's a really amazing building and they have an entire um, backup of the internet there. It's like kind of a real, like digital religious experience. It's, um, um, it is, uh, um, <laughs> Funston, yeah, Funston and Clement, I think, right? Yeah, that sounds right. It's like the, the church looking building there. Um, but we'll we'll send more details to everyone. Um, but give it up for Bette and Chelsea. Thank you so much for coming out. And I just have like one or two last um, housekeeping items. We're going to clear the chairs here. Um, but please grab your drink so that no one accidentally, um, you know, breaks the glass um, and um, feel free to enjoy. Thank you.